Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty. You've heard of active voice. You've heard of passive voice. But this week, we're also going to talk about something called middle voice. But first, I have to correct a pronunciation. Last week, I talked about why we say I didn't just fall off the turnip track. And I said that an ancient Greek playwright wrote about beggars who were so poor they ate turnip leaves. I called him Aristophanes. But it's actually pronounced Aristophanes, which I recognize immediately now that I hear it said the right way. Thanks to those of you who sent nice messages with the correct pronunciation. And here's a tip. I usually check pronunciations of words I'm not sure of, and I often use online dictionaries, which usually have audio pronunciations you can play. But Neil Whitman also told me about a site called Youglish that I've been using a lot, especially when the word or name isn't in a dictionary. That's Y-O-U-G-L-I-S-H, like English, but with U in front. It seems to search YouTube for instances where people say the word you enter, so you get to hear a few different people pronouncing the word, which I should have done with Aristophanes. And now on to the meaty middle. I got a comment on YouTube from a listener named Stephen, who asked about verbs like the one in this following sentence. The screw screwed in more easily than I thought it would. Clearly, the screw didn't screw itself in. The person who uttered the sentence screwed it in. A similar sentence came from a blacksmith he was talking with, who had cast some spearheads. That is, he'd shaped them by pouring molten metal into a mold. The blacksmith wasn't happy with how the spearheads had turned out, and he said, those spearheads didn't cast very well. As Stephen pointed out, the spearheads couldn't have cast themselves. You might think phrasing a sentence this way would lead to total confusion, but it doesn't. How is that possible? Stephen wondered if this grammatical phenomenon has a name. In fact, there is a name for it. It's usually called the middle voice, although if you want a more jargony name, you might prefer medio-passive construction. We've talked about active voice and passive voice in other episodes, But how does middle voice fit into the picture? To see how it does, we need to start with a recap of what active and passive voice are. In a typical active voice sentence, the verb's subject is the agent, the person or thing that performs the action. For example, the blacksmith cast the spearheads is in active voice. The subject of the verb cast is the blacksmith and the blacksmith is the one who did the casting. Depending on what verb you choose, there might also be a patient role for the person or thing that undergoes the action. In the sentence, the blacksmith cast the spearheads, the patient is the direct object, the spearheads, since they're what underwent the casting process. On the other hand, when a sentence is in the passive voice, the verb's subject is the patient, The sentence, the spearheads were cast, is in the passive voice, and the spearheads is now the subject. As for the agent, it doesn't have to be expressed. If you want to express it, you can do it by using the word by. For example, the spearheads were cast by the blacksmith. But here's an important point. Whether you express the agent or not, there has to be one. In other words, if you say the spearheads were cast you're implicitly saying that someone or something cast them. It didn't just happen on its own. We know this is true because a sentence like, the spearheads were cast, but no one cast them, is a contradiction. So now let's talk about those spearheads that didn't cast very well. Once again, the patient is the subject. So this sentence is similar to passive voice in that way. Also, there was definitely an agent, the blacksmith, even though we're not saying so explicitly. So that makes two things that this sentence has in common with a sentence in the passive voice. However, in form, the spearheads didn't cast well doesn't look like passive voice. In English, a verb phrase in the passive voice typically consists of some form of the verb be and a past participle. For example, in the passive voice sentence, the spearheads were cast, 
we have were, which is a past tense form of be, and the past participle cast, were cast. We don't have any of that in the sentence, those spearheads didn't cast very well. We just have the ordinary active voice negated verb phrase, didn't cast. The middle voice has some other differences from passive voice. With the passive voice, you don't have to mention the agent, although you can if you want to. With the middle voice, you can't. A sentence like, those spearheads didn't cast very well by the blacksmith, is ungrammatical. Second, middle voice sentences usually include some adverbial meaning, negation, or a modal verb, or a combination of the three. The spearheads didn't cast very well has both negation, didn't, and an adverb phrase, very well. The screw screwed in more easily than I thought it would has the adverb phrase more easily than I thought it would. Third, middle voice sentences insinuate that the responsibility for the action is not with the agent, but with the patient. When the blacksmith said, those spearheads didn't cast very well, it sounds a bit like the bad casting was not the blacksmith's fault. Maybe it was some problem with the metal. A clearer example is, the screw screwed in easily. The speaker isn't saying that their own mastery of hand tools allowed them to screw in the screw. Instead, something about the inherent or designed properties of the screw made it possible. For this reason, they sometimes also go by a more specific name, the dispositional middle voice. It was the disposition of the screw, something inherent to its nature, that made it easy to screw in. This property is tied to the last one we'll mention. Since middle voice sentences are more about saying something about the qualities of their subject, they often don't refer to specific events. For example, this history book reads like a novel. My car drives smoothly. And squiggly doesn't embarrass easily. Are general statements, not about particular events. Possibly the most famous dispositional middle voice sentence in the United States is from a TV commercial in the 1980s, which states that a certain brand of soup is the soup that eats like a meal. However, not all middle voice sentences are dispositional. For example, Stephen's sentence about spearheads and screws do refer to particular events. So do sentences such as, your receipt is printing, the painting sold for $1.2 million, and suddenly the tablecloth blew away. Next, we're going to talk about how middle voice sentences fit into a bigger category in the English language and how other languages treat these sentences differently. But first, it's a good stopping point to tell you about our sponsor this week, Campaign Monitor. Creating smart and effective email campaigns is difficult. There's a lot more to it than meets the eye. That's why Campaign Monitor created an easy-to-use email marketing platform, complete with simple drag-and-drop email editing and award-winning 24-7 customer service. Campaign Monitor gives you everything you need to run beautiful, professionally designed email marketing campaigns to grow your business. All of their beautiful email templates look amazing on every device, so you're bound to find something that will make your brand pop. And since Campaign Monitor uses detailed lists and smart segments, your messages instantly drive more engagement. No wonder it's used by more than 250,000 businesses worldwide. And now, you Grammar Girl listeners have the opportunity to try Campaign Monitor for yourself without spending a dime, a thin dime. Sign up for your free trial today at campaignmonitor.com slash grammar. Again, that's campaignmonitor.com slash grammar. As it turns out, middle voice sentences aren't the only kind of construction in which a verb that ordinarily takes a direct object doesn't take one, and instead has a patient as its subject, and isn't in passive voice. English has two others. One of them involves verbs that name actions that agents do to themselves or to each other. To put it another way, the subjects of these verbs are both agent and patient. 
For example, think about the verb shave. It can be used as an ordinary verb with a direct object in a sentence such as Fenster shaved his tail, but it can also be used without a direct object as in Fenster shaved. In that case, it means the same thing as Fenster shaved himself. For another example, the sentence Squiggly and Aardvark hugged means the same thing as Squiggly and Aardvark hugged each other, even though it doesn't use the phrase each other. In these examples, the agent doing the shaving or hugging is also a patient getting shaved or receiving a hug. The other kind of patient subject construction involves verbs such as break, melt, boil, freeze, open, close, burn, and many others. Let's illustrate with the verb burn. You can definitely use burn with a direct object. In a sentence like, my roommate had burned the cookies. You can also put it in passive voice, as in, the cookies had been burned. And your listeners will know you mean it didn't just happen, someone or something did it. But you can also use it with a patient subject, as in, the cookies had burned. In this sentence, maybe there was an agent, or maybe the burning just happened. The speaker isn't telling us. And as with the dispositional middle voice constructions, we can't specify an agent. The sentence, the cookies had burned by my roommate, isn't a possible sentence. These verbs go by several names, but the one I find easiest to understand is anti-accusative verbs. So altogether, there are four kinds of patient subject constructions in English, and only one of them is the actual passive voice. The other three are the verbs of reflexive or reciprocal action, as in, I dressed quickly, and where did Kim and Sandy meet? The anti-accusative verbs in sentences such as the door opened or my tomatoes froze, and the middle voice sentences that kicked off this episode, such as the spearheads didn't cast well and my new boat handles like a dream. We need a convenient name for these three kinds of constructions, so I'm going to use the acronym RAM, R-A-M, R for reflexive and reciprocal, A for anti-accusative, and M for middle voice. Not all languages express RAM meanings the way English does, but interestingly, these meanings tend to cluster together in different languages. A paper by Artemis Alexia Du and Idit Doran, published in 2012, divides languages into three groups. The group that includes English lets active voice forms express RAM meanings. Another group, which includes Classical Greek, Modern Hebrew, Standard Arabic, and an African language called Fula, have an active voice and a passive voice, and also a third set of verb forms which is used for ram meanings. This third set, you may have guessed, is called the middle voice. This group of languages also includes some of the Romance languages, such as Spanish and French. If you know some Spanish, you may have noticed that a sentence such as Se habla español, which is usually translated as Spanish is spoken, actually seems to mean Spanish speaks itself. That's because the same verb forms, namely the reflexive ones, are used both for actual reflexive meanings and for patient subject meanings where the agent is unknown. The third group of languages that Alexia Du and Doran identify includes languages such as Amharic and Modern Greek. These languages don't have a passive voice at all. Instead, they have an active voice, and a voice that covers all the situations where a patient is the subject. So for that reason, the non-active voice in these languages is often called the medio-passive. According to one study, middle voice is on the rise in English, with an especially big increase in frequency and variety during the 20th century. Once you start thinking about the middle voice in English, you'll start to notice it everywhere. In fact, and this is a true story, in a single day while I was writing this script, I noticed two of them in a magazine article about the airline industry. One sentence said that deregulation made it easier for new carriers to launch. 
with the patient new carriers as the subject. The other said that the galleys were the places where we enter and exit the plane and where the drink carts stow. The drink carts don't stow themselves, the flight attendants stow them. Mere hours later, an air conditioner technician told me as he wrote up the paperwork for a service call, the bill will be sending this week. A couple more hours later, I downloaded some updating software for a handheld device, and a message on my screen said, your file is downloading. The instructions I was following said that once I selected the downloaded file, your software will install automatically. The last two sentences show that sometimes it's hard to say for sure that a verb is an implicit reflexive, an anti-causative, or a middle voice verb. On the one hand, your software will install automatically means more or less the same thing as your software will install itself. So maybe install is an implicit reflexive. On the other hand, it also means more or less the same thing as your software will install all by itself which makes it look more like an anti-accusative. And finally, if you don't give any thought to the agent at all and just go with the flow, the sentence just looks like another middle voice construction. That's probably why these RAM meanings tend to pattern together so often. There are situations where it's just not clear whether they involve just one participant or two. If you use the same verb forms for all these situations, context can do most of the work of resolving them into the different kinds of RAM meanings, or it can leave it conveniently ambiguous. That segment was written by Neil Whitman, who blogs at literalminded.wordpress.com, and you can find him on Twitter at literalminded. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find all my articles and podcasts at quickanddirtytips.com, and you can get every single podcast I've ever recorded that still exists, more than 600 of them, ad-free by signing up for Stitcher Premium at stitcherpremium.com slash grammar. Use the code grammar for a free month, during which time you can binge listen all the bonus episodes. That's all. Thanks for listening. This episode is brought to you by Macmillan, our publisher. This year, Macmillan turned 175 years old. And to celebrate, we brought together Macmillan employees to share their favorite stories of working here. From publishing best-selling books. And I just remember seeing them across the concourse. And I started running up to them. I'm like, you're number one, you're number one. And we all started jumping up and down. To making a difference in the world. Of all the books that I've worked on, I feel like this book more than any other has changed people's lives. And that's an incredible opportunity. To the impact working here has on our own lives. You know, being at Macmillan was kind of a big part of our story to begin with. We officially listed our location on the marriage certificate as the Flatiron Building, and we couldn't find any others that matched in the records, so. So we're just gonna go ahead and say that we're the first to actually get married in the Flatiron Building. <laughs> Macmillan, bringing authors and readers together since 1843. For more stories of our long-standing history in the publishing business, follow us on social at Macmillan USA. That's M-A-C-M-I-L-L-A-N-U-S-A.